Okay, welcome back everyone. After uh, some, some interruption of one and a half week or so, hope you remember more or less what we have done uh, in the last lectures. In particular, we have to recall what we did, I think, already three weeks ago, when we considered um, uh, the far field, uh, where we use the Hilbert gauge. This will be important. So the formula was gamma KL, only spatial indices of T and R. Uh, with a certain prefactor, which I never remember, kappa over 4 pi c squared r. So it falls off, falls off as 1 over r, of course. And then we have the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment, dt squared, at the retarded time. So this is it. QKL, just to remind you, was the integral over, it's a function of t only a function of the, of the energy density, T and R, uh, XK, XL, integrated over the, did I write it in this way or did I write dV? I don't quite remember. So it's a volume element in, in three space. And the integration is over the sphere where all my, all my matter is, is contained. So the situation is that I have a sphere of radius capital R. Inside, I have the wildest kind of motion. Matter is moving around and uh, doing whatever it likes. But I'm at a safe distance. I'm here far away. This is the position vector r, where I, where I make the measurement. It's this r. And then the gravitational field in this area is given to a good approximation by this formula. So it's determined by the quadrupole moment uh, of the source. This was the important input which we'll need today. What we want to do today is we want to calculate the total radiated power. Yeah, so here are wild things going on. Gravitational waves are emitted. This means the system loses energy. <coughs> and this energy is, of course, distributed over the entire, over the entire solid angle. So it's over, uh, it goes in all directions. And we want to radiate the total power, which is radiated by this gravitational force. This will give us Einstein's famous quadrupole formula. So here a quadrupole enters, but that's not what one calls the quadrupole formula. Yeah, the quadrupole formula is something else. It's a formula for the radiated power. So that's the program for today. I hope I manage it to do it today because it's, yeah, it will again involve <laughs> uh, some kind of awkward calculations. But I hope that I manage today to derive Einstein's quadrupole formula. So we have already talked about the energy associated with a gravitational wave, but only for a plane harmonic wave. Actually, I have calculated, this was the last thing I've done before the, before the interruption. So I think it was one and a half weeks ago where we considered uh, plane harmonic waves for plane harmonic wave. And here we use the TT gauge, which is more than the Hilbert gauge. Yeah, this will be important in the following. Here we had the Hilbert gauge, but we didn't impose any additional gauge condition. Actually, we couldn't. Yeah, you cannot, in this general setting, impose something like a TT gauge. It just doesn't work. But for plane harmonic waves, we have this additional gauge condition. We have to keep this in mind. So our metric was, the metric perturbation was something like that. Plane harmonic wave, amplitude, complex amplitude, e to the i, k sigma, x sigma. Yeah, that's the usual phase of a plane harmonic wave. And uh, we calculated the pseudo energy momentum pseudo energy momentum tensor. And actually, we calculated only the OJ, the mixed components, space time components, because that's the only thing we need. Uh, Tij, and I did a time average. This was the last formula I had on the board. Oops, where is it? Uh, OJ, not IJ, OJ, here's a mixed one. So that's the energy flux, right? 
OO is the energy density, IJ is, a, is the stress part, and OJ, this is the energy flux, the, the, mixed, the mixed term. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, again, last time I made a calculational mistake with the numbers. The correct factor, I hope, is 8. I had something else. I think I had 16, or at least I, had, I didn't have 8. Yeah? But I, I checked several times. I'm now fairly sure that 8 is correct. Uh, AKL, AKL bar. So I, and there's a kappa on the left-hand side, which I forgot. Einstein's gravitational constant. I'm sorry? Is there a minus sign from last time? Did I have a minus sign? No, no signs are wrong. Then the minus sign was also wrong. <laughs> I think it should be a plus sign. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you had a three A's last yeah. time. I had what? Three A's last time, not one sixteenth or whatever. Yes, the, yes, the factor was, was wrong. I, I don't quite remember what, what factor I had, but it was a different factor. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But one over eight is, is correct. And actually, in the version I sent out, in the typed version, I I think everything is correct. I hope everything is correct. <laughs> okay, so you see it's proportional to kj, of course. Yeah, that's um, uh, the wave factor, the spatial wave factor in which the wave propagates. Of course, that's the direction of the energy flux. And it's proportional to the amplitude. Yeah, that's also what you, what you expected. So this is, this is quite natural. This is for a plane harmonic wave. And now you ask yourself, what have the two things together well, uh, to do with each other? And uh, yeah, the connection is that if we are in this situation, where we have a source, we are at a certain distance, we want to uh, uh, now to discuss the field uh, in, in, in a neighborhood of such a point with position vector r, then to a good approximation, it's a plane wave at this, at this distance, yeah? Because the wave surfaces are more or less plane, not precisely, but more or less. And uh, also we can make a Fourier expansion, and then we have harmonic components. Yeah, the whole theory is linear now, because we linearize them. So we can Fourier expand everything. So this is a superposition to a very good approximation of plane harmonic waves. And to that, we can apply our formula for, um, uh, for the energy flux. Uh, the problem is that if we want to insert this expression, if we want to, to identify these two expressions, we have to be careful because this only holds in the TT gauge. And here is no TT gauge involved. And this would, would, uh, will, uh, will be something we have to we have to take into account. This, this will require some additional calculations. But apart from these technicalities, which are not quite, um, uh, not quite irrelevant, apart from these, uh, I think the program is now clear. We want to apply this formula for the plane harmonic wave to the, to the wave field in the far zone in, in, this, in this area. And then we integrate over the whole sphere and we get the total uh, the total radiated power. Actually, the same thing you also do in electrodynamics, and I think most of you know this. So you have, in, uh, in, uh, instead of this formula, you have something here as the electromagnetic potential, and here is the first derivative of the dipole moment. And that's the reason why in electrodynamics you usually consider a dipole if you determine the far field. And then for the far field, you can, uh, you can, you can, you can get a, a formula uh, which involves the dipole moment. You integrate it over a whole sphere and then you get the radiated power by a dipole. That's something which is usually done in an electrodynamics course. In electrodynamics you can do even more. For point sources, you can calculate the radiation exactly everywhere, not just in the far zone. This is a famous Lama formula. I'm not sure if there's an analog of the Lama formula here. Probably it is, but I've never seen it. So I will... I will, I will only calculate uh, the, the thing in the far zone. Uh, I will not, uh, not discuss the question of how the field looks closer to the, uh, to the source. Okay, so I think the program is now clear. We just have to work it out, and it will take some time. So I already said that this is, um, uh, that this is essentially the, the energy density, yeah, the, or the energy flux, rather. The energy flux density, I think that's the proper word. Yeah? So that's the mixed component of the energy momentum tensor up to a factor, I think it's minus c. Yes, it's minus c. So s, j, so this is um, minus c, t, o, j, if you want to have, get the units right. And uh, yeah, that's what, we, that's what we want to calculate. So that's the analog of the, of the pointing vector. Yeah, in electrodynamics, that's the pointing vector. And here it's given by this expression. That's the energy, energy momentum pseudo tensor of the gravitational field. And uh, well, we can calculate this, of course, now. So um, we want to express this in terms of uh, the gamma KL. So the question is, can I rewrite this in terms of, of gamma KL? 
Well, first of all, I introduce a new notation. I introduce a unit vector in the radial direction. This is ki divided by chi naught with a minus sign, I think. Yes. Why with a minus sign? Because k with a lower index is negative. This is minus omega c. Yeah, if you remember the, uh, what we have done when we discussed plane harmonic waves, the, the zero component of the wave four vector was minus omega times c if the index is down. So the minus sign uh, has, the, has the effect that ni and ki are parallel and not anti-parallel. And this is indeed normalized. Let me sh quickly show this. It's a unit vector. Why is that? Well, let me calculate it. So this is ki, ki over ko squared, of course. Minus times minus gives plus. And uh, these are spatial indices. So I can write this as k rho, k rho. These are all four indices minus k naught, k naught over k naught square. And this here is zero. Yeah? The wave four vector is light like of a plane harmonic wave. So this is zero. And if I pull this index, then I get a plus sign plus ko squared over ko squared. And it's obviously one. Yeah? It's a unit vector. So it's just a unit vector in the radial direction. That's my ni. Yeah? And if I rewrite the sj in terms of the nj, then I get the following. Or let's do the time average thing. The sj is what? sj is minus c toj. Minus c toj averaged. And this is minus c. It's 1 over kappa, this thing. K O K J over eight kappa A K L A K L bar, and uh, I want to express the K I in terms of the N I. Uh, this is a uh, J, right? A J. Yeah. So K J is minus K O N J. So minus times minus gives plus, and then I have a K O squared, right? K zero squared. 8 kappa nj akl akl bar. So the factor by which the nj is multiplied is now the, the modulus of the, of the sj. OK, I want to express this in terms of the gamma, because then I can compare with this expression. So uh, I want to rewrite this product of amplitudes in terms of gamma. And my claim is that do gamma kl d o gamma kl for the plane harmonic wave averaged is essentially this factor of amplitudes. What's the prefactor? Uh, k o squared half. k o squared half a k l a k l bar. Let's quickly prove this. That's easy, actually. So here is the expression for gamma k l. The derivative with respect to x naught gives an i k naught as a prefactor. Yeah, so I have real part of a k l from the differentiation. I get a factor i k naught e to the i k rho x rho. That's the first factor. That's this, and then the same thing with the indices pulled up. A k l i k o e to the i k sigma x sigma averaged. OK. I write the real parts out. So this gives 1 half times 1 half is 1 over 4. Uh, no, I write the real parts out. Then it's this thing plus a complex conjugate. A i k l i k naught e to the i k rho x rho. And the complex conjugate. Uh, the i complex conjugate is minus i, so I have minus a k l bar i k naught, and this gets a minus sign in the exponent minus i k rho a rho. Oh, I'm afraid I cannot squeeze this here, so I now continue with the second factor, which is the same thing with the indices up e to the i k sigma x sigma minus a k l bar i k o 
to the minus a k sigma x sigma bracket bracket. And now I multiply this out. Then I get here a phase factor 2i k sigma x sigma. If I average this out, it gives 0 because it's an oscillating term. Here I get e to the minus 2i, this phase factor, which also oscillate, which after averaging gives 0. So only the mixed terms give something. Where the exponential functions kill each other. They have a time average. And what is a time average? 1 over 4, this times this, minus times i times i gives the plus, akl, akl bar, the if, uh, and k squared, ko squared. And here the same thing, precisely the same thing with, um, uh, yeah, again with the same sign. So times 2, and this is already real, so I don't have to, uh, uh, this is real, yeah, so it <laughs> really gives a real number. And uh, yeah, this is KO squared half AKL, AKL bar. Yeah? This is time independent, so the time average is the same as the quantity itself. And that's what I wanted to prove, I hope. Yes, it was. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so now I can rewrite my SJ in terms of, I think I can squeeze this here. My SJ time average is now what? There I have, it's in the first line. I write the C, I write the NJ, and instead of 8 kappa, I write 4 kappa. Then I have KO squared times one half times the amplitudes, and that's exactly what I have here. So this is uh, the time average of DO gamma KL, DO gamma KL. And now you might think, okay, fine, that was quite easy, we are done. Now we insert for gamma KL this expression, and then we get the SJ in the far, uh, uh, the, the, energy, the energy flux um, in, in the far zone. But that's false. And it is false because this expression does not satisfy the TT gauge condition. Yeah? And here we have assumed, during all this condition, we have assumed that the TT gauge condition is satisfied. So what we have to insert here is not the gamma KL from up there. It is a, yeah, it's a projected version of this, where we project this in a way that it satisfies the TT gauge. That's what we have to do. Yeah? We cannot do this in the general setting here, but we can do it. On a, on, a, on a small uh, volume in a neighborhood of a point here where the wave is to a good approximation, a superposition of plane harmonic waves. For this, we know that the TT gauge works, yeah? And now we do it. So we have to project our gamma KL, which, is, which we want to insert here. We want to, so let me write it here, holds only, holds only for gamma KL in TT gauge. So we are not allowed to insert the expression from up there. So um, we have to, what, what do we have to do? What are the two T's standing for? Do you remember? The first two, T means transverse and the second means traceless. So first we have to project it in a way that it becomes transverse. What does transverse mean? Transverse means we have a, we have a wave, it's propagating in this direction and the gamma in the, if it is transverse, has components only in the direction perpendicular to this. Yeah? So if we call this the z-direction when we calculate the plane harmonic waves, it means that gamma KL has components only in the x and y direction. So we have to project our gamma into this space, and then we have to make it traceless on this two space. So for, for arbitrary gamma KL we define first the traceless part. Uh, so I begin with the transverse. With the transverse part. So I call this gamma KL with one T. It is just, yeah, it's a projection into the auto complement of the direction in which the wave propagates, and that's the direction of Ni. Yeah? And uh, this is very conveniently written with the help of projection operators. I think you know projection operators, if not from anywhere else, from quantum mechanics. They are commonly used in, in quantum mechanics. Gamma ij, where this is, a, this is a projection into the auto complement of ni. So pki is Kronecker, 
these are spatial indices. Yeah, so we are uh, we are in three-dimensional space, and then we project out the direction parallel to n. So this is indeed a projection. What is the defining property of a projection? It is if I apply it twice, then it gives the same thing. Yeah, that's the defining property of a projection. Let's check if this is true. If I apply it twice, this means I apply the same operator again, summation over i. Then, well, let's do this. It is delta ki minus, uh, here the indices are wrong. It's an i, of course. nk ni. Oh, delta i l minus n i n l. Let's multiply this out. Uh, here is summation over i. So this gives the Kronecker k l minus, if I multiply these out, then the i becomes an l, n k n l. If I multiply this out, the i becomes a k minus n k n l. And if I multiply this out, I get plus n k n i n i n l, and this was one. Yeah. So you see this goes away against this, and this is precisely our projection operator. This is pkl. Yeah. So if I apply the operator twice, I get the same as when I apply it once. So if you want to show off your Latin, then you call this property idempotency, yeah, or idempotency. So if you take a if you take a potence, then you get the same thing, idem in Latin. Yeah? So it's an idempotent operator. And uh, the other property is if you pull an index, say I pull uh, the indices down, then this is delta ik. I could also write eta ik, because as indices are spatial, it's the same thing, right? Uh, minus n i n k, and that's obviously symmetric. Yeah, if I interchange the i and the k, I get the same thing. So this is p k i. And that's, if I have a projection operator which satisfies in addition this condition, then it's an orthogonal projection. Yeah, it projects orthogonally onto a certain space. And on which space does it project? Well, obviously onto the auto complement of n, because if I apply to n, yeah, if I apply this to n i, then I get here an n k, and here also an n k, so I get a zero. Yeah, so it kills everything which is parallel to n and projects onto the auto complement. So let me draw, draw a picture. If I have an arbitrary, uh, let's say, something with an index down, say w i, here's my n i, then it projects, it decomposes the thing in a part parallel to ni and a part perpendicular to ni, and that's what survives after the projection is applied. Yeah? So it kills the direction parallel to n and projects onto the auto complement. So that's the transverse part. So this thing is now transverse. It's not yet traceless. So I have... Nothing more than a Gram-Smith decomposition. I'm sorry? There's nothing more than a Gram-Smith uh, that's a very complicated way of looking at a simple thing. <laughs> I would just call it an orthogonal projection, yeah? but you can look at it in this way, right? <laughs> okay, transverse part, and now we want to have the transverse traceless part. Transverse traceless part. Traceless part. So I denote this gamma KL TT. So this is that I take the traceless thing, the gamma KLT, and subtract the trace. And now you have to be careful. This is an object which lives on this two-dimensional space. So removing the trace part means yeah, removing the trace in this two-dimensional space. On this two-dimensional space, the P is a unit operator. So it's not delta, it is P, because we are only on this two-dimensional space. And the trace is gamma, and I should use other indices, ij transverse, not delta ij, but P ij. Yeah, because I'm only on this two-dimensional space. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, so if I insert my expression for the transverse part, then I can continue. This is pk, pl, ij, gamma ij, minus pkl, pij. And now the transverse part is pi, pl. Now l is already used. Uh, Pi, J, say Rs, 
uh, gamma rs, right? And this can be simplified a bit. For the first time, I cannot do anything. Pi, plj, gamma ij. But here I have products of p's. And so I can use uh, the idempotency property. So this gives uh, pjr and with this a prs. So this is pkl prs, right? And uh, oh, by the way, I forgot a term. Ah, you didn't. You didn't watch carefully. So I <laughs> inserted this here. I wrote only the first term, but there's also the term with um, uh, what was it? Uh, boop, boop, boop. No, it's okay. Sorry. Sorry, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, PKL gamma RS. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. And now I can. Oh, wait a minute. Uh... Oh, I made a mistake here. Here I made a mistake. Look, I want to remove the traceless part. And I'm in a two-dimensional space. I always have to divide by the dimension, right? So if you are in three dimensions, then I would write 1 over 3, delta KL, and then this with a delta, yeah? But here I am in two dimensions. So the unit operator on this two-dimensional space is just the projector P, and the dimension is 2, so I divide by 2. You can check that this is indeed trace-free. You can check this easily. So I forgot this factor one half. So that what was puzzled me. And now everything is correct. So I can rename these indices. I call them i and j. And then I can take the gamma ij out of the bracket. And I have this. Uh, what is this? Uh, this was an L, right? This was an L. Uh, minus one half pkl. And I rename these indices into ij. Then I have this gamma ij. Okay, and that's the formula for the traceless transverse part. Uh, may I ask a question? So, yeah. so the second term here is like, it's not traceless, it's precisely having the trace or not? This thing is traceless. Yeah. This thing is yeah, traceless. Is, uh, yeah. So I removed the trace part. Okay. Yeah? Mm. If you remove from an expression a pure trace part, then you get something which is traceless. Mm. And that's what I've done here. They are what? I mean, they are for making the trace uh, so Yes, that's what I said. So on this two-dimensional space, the p i j plays the role of the unit operator. Or if I pull the index of the metric, if you want to call it this way, yeah? But the mixed one is just the unit operator on this, on this two-dimensional space. So it plays the same role as the Kronecker uh, uh, plays uh, on, the, on the full space. But because I, well, if I would use uh, the delta here, then I would introduce again terms which are non-transverse. Yeah? So I have to, to stay on this, on this transverse space. And that's the reason why I have to do it on the two-dimensional two space. And not for the full, full three-dimensional space. Okay, let me check, but I think it is correct, this expression. Indices. Up to indices, as usual. <laughs> let me check. <laughs> Uh, here, here, yes, yes, obviously, thank you. <laughs> but I think up to that it is correct, is it? I think so, yes. Minus one half is correct, yes. Okay, fine. So what I have to insert now into this formula for the S, for the, for the energy flux, is what? It is not the gamma KL from up there, but it's the TT part of this gamma KL. Yeah? And that's what I do now. So, for gamma KL, um, the far field near, near R, near the position R where I am. So, when I get uh, my SJ is what were the prefactors? Oops, I have it there. C over 4 kappa, C over 4 kappa. Then Nj, and then O gamma KL, gamma KL. No, not just the things inserted as we have calculated them, but the TT parts, right? That's what we have to calculate. Okay, this is what? Uh, 
Uh, so this is C over 4 kappa nj. Uh, okay, let me do it slowly. I just insert the TT part of the gamma KL, which is up there. So what do I get? I get uh, the time derivative is already there. Then I have kappa 4 pi c square squared r. And then I have to project, uh, or maybe I write the projectors first um, and without inserting the gamma KL. Let me write it this way. Let me just write um, this expression here. P K I. Oh, J is already used. I'm not allowed to use J again. P L, what else can I use? M minus one half P K L P I M. Uh, gamma I M now, right? So this is the first factor. And the second one is the same thing again with, um, with the indices up, with the KL up. So I have PK, what else can we use for indices? R and S, PLS minus one half P, K, R, P, no, P, K, L, P, R, S, gamma, R, S, bracket closed. And now let's see, where's the time derivative acting? So this is one over C d by dt, right? Does this have anything to do with t? No. It involves the direction ni, which depends on the space point where I am. So in different position, it points in a different direction, but it does not depend on t. So this is time independent. So the time derivative only acts on the gamma. Yeah? So this is c over 4 kappa nj, time average p i k p m l minus 1 half p k l PIM and the time derivative acts only on the gamma. That's the first term times PKR PLS minus one half PKL PRS uh, time derivative of gamma RS. Okay. And the projection operators, the product of them, this can be a little bit simplified because here I have summation over k and l, right? So this can be evaluated. Where do I write this? Oh, my goodness. I try to continue here. So this is what? C over 4 kappa nj, time average. So if I multiply these things out, I get a PIL, then I get a PIM, PIM, PLS, PIM, PIS, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check again. If I do this summation over K, I get an IL, then I get an, then I get an IM. I am LS. Yes, that's right. Then these two, I get a minus one half. Summation over K gives PIL, PIM, PRS. Here I have PK. Oh, okay, I write this down and then we discuss what it is. Minus one half. PKL, PKL, PIM, PLS. And the last one is minus times minus gives plus, plus one quarter. Uh, oh, here's a mistake, here's a mistake. What did I do? Oh my goodness. The indices here, they are, that's a mess here, that's a mess. I think the second term is correct, but this one is not correct. There are two L's, one of them must be an R. 
uh, probably this one, right? Let me check, is it now correct? I, J, R, S, R, S, now it's correct, but then this what I've written there is of course wrong. So let me see what we get. The indices are wrong. Okay, let's do it again. PIR, PMS. Minus one half. PIL, PIM, PIS. Then these two. PLR, PRS, PIM. PIM, what's that here? PRS. And the last one is plus 1 over 4. Now comes the term with PKL, PKL, which I do not evaluate immediately. And then PIM, PRS. Bracket. Oops, and the two time derivatives. O gamma IM, PO gamma RS. Bracket. Okay, now question, what is this here? Well, if I uh, uh, carry out one of the two sums, I get PKK, right? Using the idempotency and the symmetry. And PKK is a trace of the operator. And a trace of an operator, of an orthogonal operator, is always a dimension of the, of the target space. You can read it from here. Calculate the trace. Trace of this is 3. Minus trace of this is 1, yeah, i and i, 3 minus 1 is 2, yeah. So quite generally, this is the dimension on which the, the space projects, so this is 2. And now we have a couple of terms several times. So we have this here, 2 over 4 is 1 half, and here I have it also with 1 half, but with a minus sign, so these two terms cancel. So I think I get, I check if it is correct, or if I messed up again something. PIR PMS minus one half PMI PRS DO uh, time derivative gamma IM DO gamma RS. And well, what about the time averaging? Where's the time? The time is only here in the gammas. Yeah, so I can pull this out of the time averaging. So this is C over 4 kappa nj, PIR, PMS, minus 1 half, PIM, PRS. And now the time average of EO gamma IM, DO gamma RS. Let me check if this is correct. Uh, what did I calculate? I calculated the SJ, very good. Uh, M R M S minus one half. Lo and behold, I think it is true. Okay, very good. So this is the field. So what did we calculate? We calculated this quantity, the S J, and that's what it is. So it gives us, uh, yeah, the energy flux at this position here. Oops. At this position here, and of course it goes in the direction nj. And it is proportional to the time derivative, a product of time derivatives of the gamma. The gamma itself was already the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment. So now we have third time deriv derivatives of the quadrupole moment. So you see what is radiated away, the energy which is going out, is given by third derivatives of the quadrupole moment. So um, now you have to be a little bit careful with the time averaging. What does this mean? Actually, I should have uh, indicated this before. I was a little bit sloppy with the arguments. The whole thing depends on the vector r and on the time t. The vector r, where you have, which gives you your position, and on the time t. Now you have to be careful. What does time averaging mean? 
when we considered plane harmonic waves, we averaged just over one period. Yeah, we had a harmonic motion, motion with frequency omega. What averaging means is quite clear. Now we are in a different situation. In this situation, think of a binary. I think that's the best example. Think of a binary. So two stars orbiting a common barycenter. They orbit with a certain frequency. So you would expect uh, radiation which goes away with a, with a certain frequency, which is given by the frequency of the system. But now the system loses energy. This means the frequency doesn't stay constant. Yeah, the distance between the two bodies becomes smaller because energy is going away. The frequency becomes bigger. So when we average, this, the way in which we have been averaging makes sense only if we consider time periods which are so small that we can neglect this change of the frequency. So in the standard terminology of physics, one calls this an adiabatic change of the frequency. Yeah? So it's very slowly changing. And uh, for this averaging procedure, we consider just a time interval which is so short that we can consider the frequency as constant. And over these periods, we can average. But then we have this long-term behavior. And this long-term behavior makes the whole thing still time dependent. Yeah? So or, uh, even after time averaging, the whole thing is a function of time. That's a little bit confusing. Yeah? Because we have averaged away only the harmonic motion, but not the long-term behavior, the drift of the frequencies. Yeah? So the whole thing, this expression, and also what we have on the other side, is still a function of time. So let me write it, uh, I have to erase something, then I write it down carefully with the arguments. And we have to be, be clear about what we mean by the dependence on these arguments. I remember when I, when I saw this derivation for the first time, I was completely confused about that. So I thought, and actually I read it in a, in a paper where it was not very well explained. So it was just that we time averaged and then everything still depended on time. I said, what's the matter? <laughs> so this was I, was, I was really confused for a while. But I believe now I have understood what's going on. I hope. <laughs> so the whole derivation of the quadrupole formula is conceptual, conceptually really um, yeah, a bit tricky. I told you already that uh, some people had doubts for many years that actually the formula is correct. But it was then confirmed by experiment with such uh, astonishingly good accuracy that now I think everybody is convinced that it is correct. <laughs> Well, if you consider a completely arbitrary motion, then you can do a Fourier expansion. Yeah? So, but for simplicity, I have referred to a binary system. Yeah? The binary system has a natural frequency. Yeah? Then it would be just one frequency. In general, you would have a superposition of several frequencies. And of course, you, you average only the, the periodic part away, right? So this... Uh, if you have something which is not periodic, which has a long-term drift, yeah, so it is decreasing or increasing in the course of time, uh, then of course, uh, yeah, averaging is, a, if you really average over, over the entire history of the system, this is not a meaningful notion, right? This is meaningful only if you have, if you have, um, if you have something which is, uh, which is oscillating about a mean value. And uh, yeah, that, that's what we do. We consider intervals which are short enough so that we can consider the whole system as either monochromatic or a superposition of um, several monochromatic components, a Fourier, uh, Fourier synthesis of several monochromatic motions, and we average about these monochromatic parts, and then we have something like a long-term drift uh, left, and this is to be taken into account. Yeah? And this is actually the... <laughs> Yeah, uh, when we talk about uh, something which is radiated away by such a system, this is the quantity we are most interested in. Yeah, this long-term behavior, this behavior in which uh, uh, the energy of the system decreases, that's, what, uh, that's our main goal, to calculate this. And we will calculate it for a binary system in the next lecture on Monday. Uh, yes, uh, it is in a, in a Fourier expansion for the gamma. Yeah? You consider the whole system over a time interval which is so short that you, have, uh, that you can neglect the energy loss. Yeah? And then you have something which is, ever, uh, which is oscillating about a mean value. 
And uh, in general, it will not be just, uh, just one frequency involved, maybe several frequencies. And with respect to these frequencies, you can average them. Actually, in the examples we are doing, uh, we will have just one frequency. I think we will do three examples. And in all three of them, we have just one frequency. So we have a periodic motion, which then a harmonic, harmonic motion, which, uh, yeah, uh, which becomes time dependent because of the energy loss. OK. Oh, I shouldn't have to erase this. That was stupid. <laughs> I wanted to rewrite it with the arguments. <laughs> Okay, I have to look at my notes. <laughs> so, uh, where is it? Oops, there. So my SJ, this averaged SJ, hops on. SJ is a function of, no, I cannot write with this. is a function of T and R, yeah? It's a field. It's a function of T and R. And R ranges over this, this big sphere. We will then calculate the total flux through this sphere. And uh, yeah, T is, of course, the time. And on the right-hand side, what have we calculated? We have calculated... Uh, C and J over 4 kappa. Then these projection operators, P I M P R S minus P. I think I had the indices uh, the other way around, right? Uh, I R. And here, um, L S or what? M, M, M S. M S, okay. Let's do it the same way. And then I have to do it the other way around, P I M P R S. Oops, and then the, the time average of the gamma uh, I M, right? Mm -hmm. D O gamma R S. And this thing is now something which depends uh, on the, uh, only on one argument. Uh, yeah, okay, let me write it first in this way. So this is not wrong. This is not wrong. But actually, we can write it more specifically because we have this expression for the gamma. And we see that it enters only in terms of this combination. T and R enter only in terms of this combination, in terms of the retarded time. So if I insert this expression now, oh, now I got an, a mess of prefactors. Let me see. I have to square this, right? This is kappa squared over 16 pi squared c to the 4 r squared. Uh, the projectors, nothing happens with this. p r i r p m s minus p m i I'm sorry? Not this effect of 1 half. Yes, thank you. There was a 1 half, right. OK. And this becomes a second time derivative of the quadrupole moment, only spatial components. The quadrupole moment has only spatial components. Yeah? dt squared. Ah, there's another time derivative. So then uh, this is 1 over c squared and another time derivative. Now I have the third time derivative, right? Yeah? And here the same thing. d3 with the indices, with the other indices, rs dt cubed. And now the argument is just this here, yeah? So if I want to know my energy flux at time t, at a position vector r here, then it is given by this time average over the over a product of third derivatives of the quadrupole moment at the retarded time, yeah? Of course, everything arrives with a, with a retardation because signals have to travel at the speed c. So this is a function, it's a, it's a field, SJ is a field. Yeah? At each point, I have this flux in the radial direction. And now I want to calculate the total power, the total radiated power. So I have to integrate total radiated power uh, through sphere, must be a big sphere, of course, because we use a far field formula through a sphere of radius r, yeah? 
R is a, uh, is a modulus of this vector R. So then I get this big sphere. And I have to integrate this expression. So I call this P. The function will depend on T. And actually, uh, uh, it will also depend on the, on the radius, on the radius R. And uh, this is, of course, I have to integrate this expression, this flux, through the whole sphere. So an integral over a sphere, this is in coordinates, an integral over theta from 0 to pi and over phi from 0 to 2 pi, right? And then I have to insert this sj, which depends on t and r. And then I have the area element, the vectorial area element of the sphere. Yeah? The, I, I consider the area of the sphere and I have to take the, the vectorial aerial element because I want to have the flux through this, through this thing. So, of course, the area element pointing outwards is the usual convention. So I have uh, something in the direction of nj. And then what's the area element of a sphere of radius r? It's r squared sine theta d theta d phi, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah? I hope that's correct. So this is the vectorial area element of the sphere. And that's the thing we want to calculate. Yeah, is that true? So let's see, where, is, where are actually the angles? Where are the angles? The angles are in the nj. Yeah? The nj is a unit vector in radial direction. And the radial direction depends, of course, on the theta and phi coordinate where you are. Yeah? So the things where uh, the integration variables, the variables which have to be integrated away, are in this projector and uh, actually nowhere else, because here I have only the, the modulus of R, which is fixed on the sphere. Here I also have only the modulus of R, which is fixed on the sphere. So the only thing I have to integrate over are these projectors. But this is awkward. This is awkward. <laughs> we have to do it now. Okay, let me write it more clearly. Let me insert this expression and then let me uh, make clear which expressions actually depend on the angles. Okay, I just write it down and then we then we decompose it in a more convenient way. So I just insert this expression. So I have C over, ah, here I can, uh, I can simplify the expressions a little bit. Kappa, kappa, that's it, I think. I'm sorry? The normal vector is missing. The normal vector is, ah, here, I forgot, right, thank you. It must be a vector pointing in the direction of NJ, yes. That would be very important because it, it kills this NJ. <laughs> I would have realized in a minute that it is missing. So I have here kappa. I keep the nj in mind. I write it later. 16 pi squared c cubed r squared. Then I have the projectors pir pms minus 1 half pim prs. I have another c squared. I write it here. It doesn't matter. 1 over c squared. D3, QIM, DT3, QRS, DT3, time average. And then I have, I have not yet uh, written down this NJ. I write it here, NJ. And from the area element, I get another NJ. And I get R squared sine theta d theta d phi. OK, that's it. And 1j must be upstairs. Oops. And this is 1. Yeah. So here the nj is gone. And now let me see. And the r square also cancels very nicely. Uh, did I forget a quarter? Where is a quarter? Ah, yes, right here. It's 4 times 16. I think I can calculate this, but I leave it this way. What is the power of 3? Uh, yeah, I could write it this way, yes. Okay, anyway, this factor is independent of the angles, so I can pull it out of the integral. I think it is 64, right? Is that true? 64, I think. P squared C cubed. C squared is C to the 5. Uh, then I write the integrals. 0 to pi. 0 to pi. 
And uh, these things I have to integrate. Yeah, they, must, uh, they must be under the integral because this depends on theta and phi. IR PMS minus one half PIM PRS. Uh, now I can close the integral, sine theta d theta d phi, because these things do not involve the angles. Yeah? I, I should take it at the retarded time. Um, T minus R over C. Yeah? So this has nothing to do with the direction. Yeah, this is just uh, uh, the modulus of the radius vector. So I have D3 Q I M D T cubed, D3 Q R S D T cubed at the retarded time, T minus R over C. Okay, so what we have to calculate, and then we get Einstein's quadrupole formula, what we have to calculate is this mess of integrals here. And this is a bit awkward. How much time do I have? Ah, I, can. I think I will not fully calculate this in all details. So um, let me remind you what these projectors were. So the P, PIR was delta IR minus NI, NR, right? And the n, if I use now my polar coordinates, then this is a, this is a three vector, a vector with three components. And uh, well, do I remember how this was in spherical polars? I think it was cosine phi, sine theta, sine phi, sine theta, and cosine theta, okay? I think that's true. <laughs> So I have to insert these expressions, and then I have to calculate these integrals. Yeah? These are elementary integrals, quite elementary integrals. You get factors of, I don't know, sine squared theta times cosine theta under the integral and things like that. So you can look them up in Bronstein and uh, you can calculate it. But it's a mess because it's so many terms. Yeah? And I will not calculate all of them on the board. I will just write a few of them. I will, I will prove uh, the expressions for a few of them. And uh, well, the structure which you get, if you insert these expressions here, you see you have products of p's, two, uh, two factors of, of p's. This gives you at most four factors of n. Yeah? If these two hit each other, you get no n at all. If this hits this, you get two factors of n. And if this hits itself, you get four factors of n. So what we need to know is, what are the integrals over two factors of n and over four factors of n? And I write down. So for calculating the integral, what you need is the following. Calculating the integrals, you need, or we need, <laughs> I should say. I write this as a claim, and then I prove only part of the claim. So I need to know what is this here, n, i, n, j, and then the area element, sine theta, d theta, d phi. What is this? Yeah, uh, zero to pi, zero to two pi, and my claim is this is delta i j with the prefactor, and I will prove this. Oops, here it is. Four pi over three is a factor. Delta i j. And the other one, with the four factors, I will not prove, I will, but I will tell you what it is. So this is integral 2 pi, integral 2 pi, ni, nj, nk, nl, sine theta, d theta, d phi. Again, with a fa funny factor, 4 pi over 15. And then the totally symmetrized products of deltas. So this is delta ij, delta kl, plus delta ik, delta jl, what is still missing? Delta il, right? Plus delta il, delta jk. That's my claim. And I will prove the first identity. And the, but I type, I type it out for the other one. It, it's fairly analogous, just more complicated for the, for the second part. Proof of, proof of the first uh, equation. 
Actually, uh, yeah, there's kind of a trick. If you, if this doesn't uh, doesn't uh, come to your mind, it could be really off, uh, awkward. And the trick is that you multiply this with an arbitrary xi i xi j, yeah, and then you compare coefficients. So in the end, you get something where this is also proportional to xi i and xi j, and because they are uh, arbitrary, you can compare the coefficients. That's a trick if you want to call it this way. So. For every xi1, xi2, xi3, just the three tuple, arbitrary three real numbers, xi1, xi2, xi3. I, I calculate this expression transvected with xi i, xi j. Integral 0 to pi, integral to pi, and i and j sine theta d theta d phi. Now I calculate around for half an hour, now maybe not quite as long, <laughs> and then I get an expression which is also proportional to these two factors. And then I can compare coefficients. Yeah? What I get must then be this integral. So that's the idea of proving this. First of all, you see these are not dependent on theta and phi, so I can pull them under the integral, and then I have a square. Yeah? I have xi i n i squared, 0 to pi, 0 to pi, so this is xi i n i squared. Yeah? These two things multiplied with these two things give a square. Sine theta d theta d phi. Oops. And now I have to calculate. So I've written the n i here. This is the n i. And I have to, uh, to write out this sum here. Integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to pi. So this is a square of a bracket. And in the bracket, I have xi1 times this here, cosine phi sine theta, plus xi2 sine phi sine theta, plus uh, xi uh, sine 3 cosine theta, whole thing squared, sine theta, d theta, d phi. Okay, and now I multiply the square out. Okay, if I square the first term, I get psi 1 squared, cosine squared, sine squared of theta. That's the first term squared. Then this term squared. Sine squared phi, sine squared theta. And the last one squared. OK, I just write these terms. There are three other terms, right? But I don't write them. Why do I not write them? Because they give 0. So if I multiply these two things with each other, oh, let's begin with this one, this is simpler. I get something proportional to cosine of phi. And if I integrate the cosine of phi over a full period, I get zero. Yeah? Cosine of phi over a full period of two pi gives zero. Same thing here, integral over sine phi gives zero. And these two things together, cosine phi times sine phi, hope everybody remembers, this is one half sine two phi. Yeah? So it's again something which integrated over a full period gives zero. So I get three times the zero from the mixed terms. And uh, okay, now it doesn't look too bad. So I have, well, the first term is what? It is xi1 squared. So it factorizes, right? So the integral over 2 pi cosine squared phi d phi and integral over 2 pi sine squared and another sine, so I have sine cubed, d theta. That's the first term. Let's say in the second term is xi2 squared integral 0 to pi sine squared phi d phi integral 0 to pi sine cubed theta. And the last one it's independent of phi, so the phi integral at first is xi 3 squared, it's supposed to be xi. 
Then the integral over phi, the integrand doesn't depend on phi, so it just gives a factor 2 pi, right? Oh, oh, well, I can, could write it down. So it's integral d phi from 0 to 2 pi. And integral cosine squared times sine. d theta, 0 to pi. OK. And all 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 integrals, which are there, are very easily solvable. Does anybody know by heart what this is? Well, what I know by heart is what the average of cosine squared is. This is 1 half. So this must be, the interval uh, has a length 2 pi. This must 2 pi times 1 half. So it must be pi. And if you, feel, you can prove it, for instance, with a partial integration, right? You write this as cosine times cosine, and then you apply a partial integration, and uh, you uh, integrate one part out, and then, then you get it. But uh, this is one I know by heart. And the same thing here. It's the same, of course. It's the same integrand, just shifted a bit. So this is also pi. The other ones I do not know by heart. Ah, this one I know by heart, <laughs> 2 pi. <laughs> But the other ones I do not know by heart. And I think none of you know, or do you? So I, but you can easily look them up. Uh, where am I? Here. Uh, or calculate them. So for instance, this here, of course, uh, where is it? This here can easily be calculated because this is d cosine theta, yeah, up to a, up to a factor, of up to a minus sign. So you can easily calculate it yourself. But I was too lazy to do it. I just looked them up. So what is this here? No, this is the wrong sheet. Uh, where am I? Sine cubed, sine cubed here. This is 4 third. This is 4 third. Uh, here's the same thing, also 4 third. And uh, the last one is, uh, where am I here? Mm, 2 third. So let. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, one pi, one pi, one pi. Every factor has one pi. I think that's correct. No, I think that's true. I think that's true. Uh, no. I have to admit I just looked it up. I didn't calculate it myself, but I, I think it's true. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, how would one solve this? Uh, I guess also with a substitution. I would write it as, uh, well, one factor of sine squared. I would write as 1 minus cosine squared. And then I have sine theta d theta, which is d cosine theta. And then, no, it's, it's a polynomial. There's no pi in it. It's a polynomial. I, I wouldn't expect a factor of pi, actually. OK, and I, I trust that I, I looked this up <laughs> correctly. <laughs> OK, so let's collect everything together. I think uh, every term has a factor 4 pi over 3, right? 4 pi over 3. And then we get psi 1 squared, 4 pi over 3, psi 2 squared. 4 pi over 3 psi c squared. And this can be written in the following way. This can be written as delta ij psi i psi j. OK? And now I compare. That's what I have calculated. That's what I have started, started with. So now I see that this here must be the same as this here, because it holds for an arbitrary psi i. Yeah? So, and that's what I wanted to prove, I hope. Yes. Yes, that's what I wanted to prove. Well, and for the other for the other thing with the four factors, it's essentially it's the same method. Yeah, you just have four factors here. This doesn't make it easier. <laughs> the expressions become a bit longer. But the type of integrals which you have to to uh, to calculate is exactly the same. Yeah. So I think you we can can leave it with this. Actually, I'm too lazy for for doing all this on the board. But I've typed it out here, and I hope it's correct. So if I insert now these expressions. Oops, where am I? Yeah, that was the impression. This was the integral we wanted to calculate. Yeah? 
And now we have, we have all the information which we need for writing out this integral, for uh, these integrals, for actually calculating them, right? We insert for the projectors these expressions, then we got terms proportional to deltas, proportional to factors, proportional to factors of two n's, and proportional to factors of four n's, and we have the results now. So then we insert these integrals, and I just give you the result. So inserting into expression for the power, Gives. I, I always get chronicers here. Yeah, I always get chronicers. So this means, oops, I get factors of this form yeah, with different indices because all of them are hit with, with a certain number of chronicers. So I don't get anything else but factors of this form with various indices. And what you get is actually the following. P of R and T is what it is. Uh, Kappa over 40 pi c to the 5. And then these terms which come from contractions with, uh, with the Kronecker's QMN, dt cubed, d3q with upper indices, dt cubed minus 1 over 3 d3q. And now it's a trace. Mm dt cubed, and again, I could write a square, but I write it out dt cubed. And of course, the whole thing to be taken at the retarded time. And that's Einstein's quadrupole formula. It's usually written in a nicer form, where you introduce the so-called reduced quadrupole moment, which is just the Q with the trace removed. Now we are in three dimensions. So now I'm talking about a three-dimensional trace, not a two-dimensional as before. You have to be careful with this. So I introduce a reduced quadrupole moment, rewrite it, and then we have the formula, which we can then discuss. So I should not do the same mistake again, erasing the equation which I need now. Oops. That's the one I need. By the way, when Einstein derived this formula, he also made a couple of calculational mistakes. <laughs> so there are, there are some numerical factors wrong in this. Uh, this was in two papers, right? The first one was 1916. And then the final formula was in, in a 1918 paper. And uh, yeah, even the second one was not, not free of, of numerical mistakes. So I, I'm in good company if I make numerical mistakes. <laughs> So I will introduce now the reduced quadrupole moment. And I've already warned you that some people call this the quadrupole moment. So when they say quadrupole moment, they um, tacitly mean the reduced quadrupole moment, the one which is trace free. So you have to be careful if you look into books uh, what exactly they mean if they say quadrupole moment. So maybe I can squeeze this here and let the, let the blackboard uh, dry for a few minutes. So, into, actually I have already introduced it, I mentioned it before. Introduce the uh, reduced quadrupole moment. I denote this with a dash, QKL. Yeah. This is just the QKL I have used until now which I had the, the definition on the, I just erased it, it was on the board, it was given by an integral over the energy density. And now I subtract a trace part, and now I'm in three dimension, so it's one third, 
my unit operator on my three-dimensional space is a Kronecker, and I have Q i j delta i j, which according to our rules I could also write as q i i if I like to do this. Yeah? So it's a three-dimensional trace now. So if I insert this into this expression, so then of course q k l is q k l plus one third delta k l q i i. So I insert this expression here and then it will become very simple, very compact, so this long derivation, which was difficult in various respects, gives a surprisingly compact and nice result. Kappa over 4 pi c to the 5. Okay, time averaging. And now I insert for the q, the q with a, with a, with a dash. So it is d3 q dash dt cubed. Uh, what are the indices? Mn. Mn d3 q dashed Mn. Then the mixed term, where this hits the trace term, plus, and this comes with a one third, d3 q Mn dt cubed. Delta Mn d3 qii dt cubed. Then the other way around, because this is symmetric, it gives the same thing again. And then the two, uh, the two parts, uh, the two trace parts together. One third plus one third, uh, times one third gives one over nine. And then I have uh, delta mn, delta mn, d3 qii, d uh, third time derivative, d3 qjj, dt, third three. So this, this is this term, yeah? Just for the q, I have inserted this expression, and then I have multiplied it out. It gives me four terms. And then there's another one which was just there, minus one third, third time derivative, times third time derivative, bracket t minus r over c. Okay, what can we do here? So this here is, if I carry out this summation, then I get a trace. What is this? Uh, is this look, really the, the term is a dash? Then it's zero, of course, because this is trace free. Yeah? This here is zero. Yeah? Because this is trace free, if I calculate the trace, I get zero. Uh, but this is not zero. This is not zero. This here is, what is this? This is a trace of Kronecker. Question for the audience, what is this? Everybody falling asleep? <laughs> we are in three dimensions. <laughs> it's three. <laughs> yeah, that's where you have to be careful. Yeah, sometimes we are in two dimensions, sometimes we are in three dimensions, but now it's three. So what is this? Three over nine. That's one third with a plus. And here I have one third with a minus. So the two things cancel out. So I have only the first term. And that's what I promised you. I get a very compact, very convenient formula, which is actually easily remembered. Yeah? D3 QMN, reduced quadrupole moment, transacted with itself. T minus R over C. Oops. Yeah, and that's a way in which radiated power is calculated. So this is now the total power radiated into all of space, yeah, into all directions. So if you are somewhere, there's a source far away from you, of course only a very small portion of this total radiated power will hit you, fortunately, <laughs> because otherwise uh, it could be quite, um, quite inconvenient, because uh, as we will do examples, and you will see that uh, for, merging, for merging black holes, 
as in the incident which was observed on 15th September uh, 2015. If you are close, if you get really a, a big portion of the total radiated power, this could be very, very detrimental for your health. Okay, maybe I should express uh, the kappa in terms of the G, because then you see how many powers of C you have here in the denominator. What was kappa? Kappa was 8 pi, uh, the Newtonian gravitational constant, divided by C to the 4, right? And then I have 4 pi C to the 5. So I get all together a C to the 9, right? C to the 9, and this gives us the 2 times this here. Maybe this is more instructive. Because, well, if you have a C to the 9 in the denominator, you can expect that usually in ordinary units, this is not a very big quantity, right? So you need really very powerful sources. So this term must be really big if you want to measure something at a large distance. Did I forget the R? Where's the R? Uh, no, for the, oh, sorry, for the total radiated power, the R cancels out, of course, yeah? In the formula for the SJ, I had an R dependence. This fall, fell off with R. But now we integrate it over a full sphere, and then the R cancelled out, of course. I have the R dependence only in the retardation term. Yeah, so the whole thing actually does depend on R, because uh, here's this expression. It, uh, the farther you are away, the more you have to, to retard the, the time. But there's no fall off with 1 over R, of course, because uh, you integrate over the entire sphere. So that's the formula. So this is Einstein's quadrupole formula. So you need a source which has a quadrupole moment, and actually the, the source, uh, the, the traceless part of the quadrupole moment must have a non-vanishing third time derivative. Then you get something radiated away. And we will do examples for this. Well, now I will say that's not easy to calculate this. I need to know the quadrupole moment, the energy quadrupole moment of my source. Isn't that awfully complicated to calculate this for some realistic system? Yes, it is. But usually, you make a simplifying assumption, so it requires, requires to know yeah, the QMN, then you can subtract the trace. So I write the one without the, the trace removed, which is a function of t. You have, need to know these quantity, this quantity, t of r, x, k, x, uh, m, n x, m, n, n, these three r. And this goes over the, the, the region where your sources are sitting. And well, if you have something very hot and turbulent where you have all kinds of energy, maybe tensions and whatever into, in, 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 within your matter, then this is awfully complicated to calculate this. But for many applications, we can actually assume that the energy density, that's the energy density, is essentially determined by the rest masses. That's for many systems, this is true for ordinary matter. You know the rest mass is incredibly much bigger than any other form of energy for ordinary matter. Yeah? So for many applications, it is, uh, it is possible to approximate this by the, by the rest mass. And then it becomes comparatively simple. The motion, then we only need to know, to know the motion of the masses. Yeah, we don't have to care about stresses, or temperatures, or whatever else might be in the system, then we only have to, have to consider uh, the masses. And all of the examples we will calculate are actually of this kind. So for, for matter which is not extremely fast moving, yeah? so the inter in internal motion must be, all the motions must be small with comparison to the velocity of light, which is not extremely fast moving. We may approximate the TOO, which is the energy density, by the mass density, the rest mass density, uh, there's a factor c squared, right? Energy, how, what was the formula? E is m times c squared, I think, right? <laughs> I've heard this formula before, I guess. So I must have a factor of c squared, and then this is a, this is a rest mass density.
And if you do it this way, if you do it in this way, then you have to replace the energy quadrupole moment by the ordinary mass quadrupole moment. That's what you know, what you know from mechanics, right? You have a body, let's say for simplicity, for simplicity a rigid body, then I hope you know how to calculate the quadrupole, uh, the quadrupole tensor associated with this. It's essentially the, the, the tensor of inertia. Yeah? This is, uh, again, with a trace part, you have to be careful, but it's an equivalent notion, an equivalent, equivalent to, the, to the tensor of inertia. And uh, this is comparatively easy to calculate. In particular, if you have a system of mass points, and that will be the kind of examples we are doing, then you can easily calculate the, uh, the, the mass quadrupole moment. We may approximate, replace uh, Q, Km by the mass quadrupole tensor. Yeah, that's the energy quadrupole tensor. And so mass quadrupole tensor I denote by I. IKL, which is the same expression, but instead of TOO, the energy density, we write the mass density. Uh, it's again the function of T, R of T, XK, XL, D3R, yeah, over the region occupied by the matter. And then, well, if you want to use Einstein's uh, quadrupole formula in this approximation, then of course we need the traceless part. So again, I denote this by a double bar. So this is IKL minus the trace part. One third delta K A I I of T. Then we have P of R and T is approximately, well, this is an approximation, right? Uh, this is an approximation here. Then we have, where was the quadrupole formula here? 2G over C to the 9. I check the prefactor. Just. Uh, and then I write, uh, well, Q is C squared times mu, so I get a C to the 4. So altogether I have a C to the 5 now in the uh, denominator, which is still <laughs> a fairly big number in conventional units. D3 I with double bar, MN, DT, D3, IMN. Dt at the retarded time. Okay, and that's the form, the way in which we will apply the formula. So let me just repeat what kind of approximations enter into this. So from the very beginning, we work with the linearized theory. Yeah, you always have to keep this in mind. Gravitational waves actually are nonlinear. The superposition principle is not valid in a strict sense. But we made the approximation that we linearized everything, and then. Uh, uh, then superposition principle is valid, and that was the framework in which we worked. When we calculated the energy momentum pseudo tensor, we restricted to the lowest non-trivial uh, order, which required for the field equation the second order. Yeah, for the solution still the first order, but for the field equation the second order. So again, we are in lowest order. What else did we do? Then we are uh, in the far zone. So this formula does not tell you what happens near, to the, near, the, near the source. Yeah? You cannot use the, formula, the formulas we have derived, in particular for the SJ, for the, uh, for the energy flux. You cannot use them if you are close to the, to the sources, only far away. And here in the last step, if you use this formula, then you also have to assume that nothing too wildly happens inside your source. Yeah? so that you have contributions to the energy momentum tensor, particular to the energy density from, uh, from, other, from other things than the rest mass density. If other components are dominating, then this is not, not valid. So you can see as a mathematical model, for instance, people consider something like a null dust. Yeah? So we have uh, something like a dust, we are, we are used to this. These are perfect fluids without pressure, and uh, the particles move uh, at a velocity slower than the speed of light. You can make the same model where the particles move at the speed of light. 
Yeah, so this would be a model for a very, very hot, very energetic uh, kind of, of matter. Models of this kind are, are considered. Then, of course, this approximation would be totally idiotic, yeah? because all the energy comes from something else, not from the rest mass in this case. But if we assume that we have ordinary sorts of matter, stars in the way which we, are, which we know them, which are then spiraling towards each other, then this is a very good approximation. And then we can use this formula. And we will do, of course, the most important and uh, yeah, most instructive example is a binary system. So I will do this on the board. And I think we will do two examples in the worksheet. We will certainly do a rod. Yeah, if you have a rod, an iron rod or so, and you let it rotate. Yeah? You might assume, well, it's a big rod and a long rod, and if it rotates quickly, maybe I can produce gravitational waves which I can measure in the lab. Yeah? So you can try to, to calculate what will come out of that. You will find out that you will not be able to produce gravitational waves which are measurable in the, in the, in the lab. But it's, it's something which is instructive to do. Yeah? And I think we will also do the math which is just uh, uh, yeah, popping up and down, yeah? oscillating periodically. That's actually the simplest example. Of course, you need an external force to let it do this thing. Yeah? It wouldn't do this by themselves. You have to take it and pull it up and down rhythmically. That's the easiest example. So I think these two examples we will do on the worksheet and the, the binary system I will do on the board and then we can discuss the Hulse-Taylor pulsar and we can judge if Hulse and Taylor got the Nobel Prize uh, rightfully for the work they have been doing. Okay, that will be the program for next Monday. Have a nice weekend.